This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, Obama to make Muslims a race. Back by popular demand, Daniel Greenfield, a Shulman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center, and he is the writer of the blog, The Point, that can be found at frontpagemag.com. Go to it, the best blog on the planet. Daniel Greenfield, what an honor to have you back on the Glazov Gang. The honor is all mine to be back once more with the great Jamie Glazov. Fantastic. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest, how excited are you to be back on the show? Well, you know, doing all the calculations, having one finger up to the wind, I would estimate roughly, say, 22.44%. That's the Daniel Greenfield that I like. And uh, moving on from our attempt at humor and entertainment to the serious issues of our time, it's getting scarier and scarier. Daniel, you wrote this blog the other day at The Point, how Obama is going to make Muslims a race. Now, you've been talking about this for quite a while over the years, how the left, and also, of course, Islamists, we've got the Unholy Alliance working together here, they're making Islam a race. It's the racialization of Islam. And this is brilliant from their end, because what the left has done is, one way or another, they accuse people of racism. People are terrified of being accused of racism. So... When Islam begins to perpetrate Sharia and Jihad and engages in the Islamization of the West, we can't do anything because if we try to say anything about Jihad or female genital mutilation or honor killings, we're being racist. And now they're going to solidify this because Obama is planning to do what? The left, of course, uses racism as its main and primary weapon. Uh, its central accusation, as you've already said, Jamie, is to accuse everyone, anyone, and all the time of racism. Uh, now, they already actually accuse anybody who actually is a counterterrorism expert, a serious counterterrorism ex expert who discusses uh, the intersection of Islam and terrorism of being a racist. But they actually do want to formalize it. This would enable them to formalize it. This would enable them to effectively say that Islam is a race. Now, as I've discussed in the past, um, what Muslims do is a very interesting shell game, which is that Islam is treated as a nationality. It's treated as a culture. It's treated as a religion. It's treated as a race selectively when it's convenient. So, for example, how can you teach Islam in the schools? You've read these stories about parents... Um, learning that their children were forced to recite um, Islamic verses and even convert to Islam um, in schools. How is that possible? It's possible because Islam is also treated as a culture. Therefore, at this point, it's a culture, not a um, religion. And therefore, you, can't you can actually teach it and even compel students to participate in it. So moving it to a race now actually adds another advantage to Islam. Wow, the left is pretty brilliant and it's political war. And uh, this, is, this is almost a catastrophe now. I mean, we already know we, we're in a catastrophe, but man, are they pushing this hard. And, and um, the West is just in a zombie-like state, sleepwalking into suicide. So look, let's use a parallel here. Let's say Nazism communism, these totalitarian systems, it would have been catastrophic if Nazis and communists racialized their ideology and if the West had to live with its principles and abide by its principles, right? Because in that context, you wouldn't be allowed to criticize Mein Kampf. You couldn't criticize Adolf Hitler or Nazi principles because you would be accused of being racist. With communism, if it was racialized in whatever absurd way they would have done it, you wouldn't have been able to even point out how classless societies inevitably lead to a terrorist component. It would be illegal to criticize communism and Nazism, right? Certainly, certainly it would have been far more devastating if the Nazis and the communists had been able to, as you've said, racialize their ideology, Arguably, the communists were, in fact, able to do just that. And, you know, arguably, in a sense, the triumph of the left by using um, accusations of racism does indeed represent um, the racialization of the left. It represents the racialization of some of the very same ideas 
and agendas of communism. So when you see, for example, Black Lives Matter, the original um, use of radical uh, militancy by radical racist groups were actually originally communist back. You know, arguably, again, Black Lives Matter, the kind of black nationalism they celebrate, has long-standing ties to communism. Uh, their hero uh, is actually, the cop killer is actually hiding out in communist Cuba. So there's certainly a good deal of intersection between uh, the two. There's a good deal of intersection. Um, there are a good deal of cases where um, communists, the left, uh, did indeed racialize it during the McCarthy era. They insisted that anybody who actually said anything bad about communism was, quote unquote, red baiting. Red baiting uh, sounds sort of like a racial accusation. Right. Not, of course, in the terms of skin color, right. but it did suggest that uh, the people making it, the people actually criticizing communism were somehow bigoted, that there was something um, bigoted about red baiting, um, even though there was, this was no rational argument for it at all. So the left actually does rely on this quite a bit. It's quite dangerous. And with Islam, they do have already made a racialization of it because Muslims are members of a minority group. The problem is that globally, internationally, Muslims are a racial um, an ethnic or religious majority. They're for majority societies. They can commit genocide and ethnic cleansing to ensure that. The constant conflict with Israel, for example, is a case of the regional Muslim majority, the Arab majority, using uh, genocide and ethnic cleansing and terrorism and all the weapons of violence and warfare to ensure that they actually are the majority. Islamic terrorism against America, against Europe, the kind of violence we've been seeing, the violence in Germany, uh, the assaults there, arguably, again, are an extension of this essential privilege. Uh, Islam is very xenophobic. It's been xenophobic since its origins with Muhammad. And it's really based on being the majority, the uh, superior, the what Netanyahu, I believe, called the master faith. I don't really think that's a necessarily a great formulation, but it does get at the problem because there is, while there isn't an explicitly racial component, uh, there is very much the idea that there's, this is a superior group of people. So in that sense, Islam has parallels with the Nazis. Daniel, I mean, this is just surreal in its tragedy. I mean, what we're entering now, we're already there, by the way, but they're actually going to legislate this now into law. So if people like us want to point to the Hadith that inspire and sanction female genital mutilation, if we want to point to Surah 9.5 and Surah 9.29 and 47.4 that inspire and sanction killing of unbelievers, if we want to point to verses in the Quran that inspire and sanction wife beating, uh, you know, killing of apostates wherever you know these teachings exist in Islamic theology. If we want to point to the texts that inspire and sanction jihad and violence against unbelievers, we will be in by law being racist. Race is indivisible from personal identity. In this case, we're talking about ideology. Islam as an ideology is very much um, a matter of choice, at least in the West. You choose to believe the particular tenets of Islam. And that's a choice, and it should be um, just regarded on its own merits, rather than just saying that uh, any criticism of it is irrational bigotry, that it's just attacking a person's uh, vital and immutable characteristics. So this is uh, really a, a way that they're conflating the two, and it's a very dishonest way of doing that because... And really, it's alien in some ways really to the ideas of the left, which, uh, which were in the past really quite skeptical of religion. They're so skeptical of religion. Uh, they're quite skeptical of Christianity or Judaism, but Islam gets a complete pass. And this is actually a convenient way for the left to view it as, having, as getting this kind of complete pass, as being able to say, uh, well, we, don't, uh, we can't criticize Islam because it's a race, it's immutable. Muslims are members of an immutable group, and we don't actually have to think about their religion or take it seriously or be remotely concerned about it. All we can do is assume that it's a fundamental part of them, and then that way it's above criticism, it's above challenge, um, it's above anything and everything. And this is really a vital threat. It's a vital threat to any kind of political discourse. It's a vital threat to free speech, as we've discovered um, really when uh, Hillary Clinton locked up the guy, saw to it that the guy who made um, video mocking Muhammad was blamed for it and locked up. And we've already seen this with Islamic terrorism, where anybody who criticizes Islam is blamed for Islamic violence, which supposedly results immutably from it. Um, increasingly, of course, once you actually position Islam as a race, once you say that you actually have to have quotas for Muslims, which is the inevitable next part of uh, the MENA category, uh, once you say that, then you're effectively bringing closer to the idea that there has to be special protection for Muslims, which really means um, special censorship of anybody who criticizes Islam. 
And so, Daniel, if they racialize Islam now, I mean, they've already done it, you know, because we know that Islam is racialized in our culture. I mean, you even dare to point out the texts in Islam that inspire jihad, you're already a racist um, in their view. But now that this will become legal, if Obama succeeds in making Islam a race, we will be 100% handicapped from standing up to Sharia and to jihad, correct? Counterterrorism really depends heavily on what effectively is profiling. Now we can play all these games that we like, but effectively we actually have to be able to selectively deal with Islamic terrorism. Now, otherwise we're stuck with this kind of TSA situation where the TSA is just uh, searching six-year-old girls and disabled 90-year-old, 98-year-old World War II veterans uh, who are in a wheelchair to avoid actually singling out Muslims. And you can't do, so to, you can't do this at a national level with counterterrorism without ha really dis thoroughly disastrous and horrible results. But it really the whole idea of actually any kind of um, profiling Muslims in any way, even counterterrorism itself, even fighting terrorism, uh, is black and white uh, disproportionate impact. It's disparate impact. It's, uh, well, the mass majority of terrorists that we're dealing with are Islamic terrorists, which means it's disparate impact, which means since, of course, Muslims can't possibly be responsible for more terrorism than anybody else, this is the logic we use elsewhere with various policing, then it must be, it must be undeniably so, that there's something bigoted, there's something wrong with our counterterrorism policy. This sounds, of course, utterly insane, uh, but this is the actual practical thing that would result, and there would be test cases, there would be legal cases, and certainly once we have a MENA category, it would be much easier just to win that kind of decision and to wreak complete and utter and total havoc on our counterterrorism policy, which is certainly one of the goals of this particular piece of nasty proposals. This is incredible, the unholy alliance between the left and uh, Islam. Uh, again, brilliant. they're brilliant and shrewd in political war, and we are losing this battle. And uh, we've come to a point now where if we want to prevent and stop a jihadist from blowing himself up among women and children, and we want to take the measures to stop that, if we want to stop the female genital mutilation against young girls, if we want to stop honor killings, we will be the racists of our time. Any dissent from Islam, of course, in any way, you're correct, would result in us being charged with bigotry. If you're against honor killing, well, then you're interfering with um, the immutable practice of their culture, which is now also a race, and as a race, who would enjoy even more special immunity. If you have any issues with Islamic terrorism, well, you're just, again, once again, you're interfering um, with their identity. If you have any issues with their bigotry, their hatred of Christians, their persecution of Jews, once again, you're the one who's actually a bigot. I mean, the whole premise of this entire, the left's premise of this entire war on terror has been that the issue is not Islamic terrorism, the issue is our bigotry. So now they would actually have legal justification for it, they would have legal bounds in which to enclose it. So they would be able to say that um, no, the issue is not Islamic terrorism. The issue is, of course, that we're singling out Muslims, and that causes Islamic terrorism. There's no Islamic terrorism. There's just our bigotry. Our bigotry results in um, blowback, it results in backlash from Muslims. And if we just stop being so bigoted as to fight Islamic terrorism, Islamic terrorism would go away. Of course, this, there's no possible universe in which could, this could work, and we actually tried this to a good degree under Obama. The results were ISIS. The results were a vast explosion in Islamic terrorism. But uh, the goal here, obviously, is not nobody seriously thinks that this would actually work, except maybe some of the useful idiots. Uh, the goal here is obviously to destroy the West, to destroy Western civilization, to destroy really the only bulwark against the caliphate and the rise of the Islamic State. And this is the story of the left, how humanitarianism uh, disguises itself and overall how evil disguises itself as the greatest humanitarianism. Quite, quite a story. Daniel Greenfield, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me one more time, and I look forward to the next time if I'm not being too presumptuous. Thank you. And to our audience, please remember this is a fan-generated program. We're only here because of you. Please support us at jamieglazov.com. That's if you like this program. And make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel of this show, The Glazov Gang. We'll see you soon. Good night.